Good evening, CFC family. It's awesome seeing everybody back here this evening. Who's excited to hear a good word this evening? Praise the Lord. Well, first we're going to give God some praise and declare his good things. Joy. 
all the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. marching orders we thank you tonight we worship you we worship you take joy and take pleasure and our worship tonight Lord we love you we praise you we love you we praise you we love you we praise you we thank you come on lift your voices lift your voices to him hallelujah great all you Lord Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. That part right there, Tim. Great are you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we sing it to you with all our hearts tonight. <laughs>
you tonight Lord we praise you we're here for you tonight Lord we come to hear from heaven and father we know our anticipation and our expectation gives you an invitation and so father we thank you tonight that the word of God will gain entrance in our hearts and our lives we thank you that you speak by your spirit and to us and we thank you that by your church, great and mighty things will happen. We thank you for the needs of the people being met tonight by your mighty spirit. For you are good and your mercy does endure forever. And Father, for this, we'll give you the praise and give you the glory for it all now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's lift our hands and thank him again. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you tonight, Lord. We thank you tonight. We thank you tonight for your mighty works, your goodness to the children of men. Hallelujah. We praise you and we bless you tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Young and old, we, we thank you every need met, Lord. We thank you for hearts open, minds renewed, lives transformed tonight. We thank you for the quickening power of your spirit. And we thank you and praise you for it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, you know, we all know that we have, uh, you know, a guest here tonight, uh, Joe, Brother Joe Morris. Amen. And we want him to feel welcome. But you know what? Where, what we really want tonight is the Spirit of God to continue to be honored and, and praised and, and, and thanked. And, and Brother Joe just be able to flow with the Spirit of God. So, Brother Joe, you just come right now, amen, in this, in this presence of God. You direct us on what you want. If you want us to go back into worship, you want to go right on into whatever you want to do. You, co you come on. We just, we're just open tonight to the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Hallelujah. Amen, Praise amen, God. amen. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Man, it's just good to worship the Lord, isn't it? Hallelujah. The most proper, thank you, the most proper righteous thing we can do is to honor Him, to magnify Him. You know, people say, well, you guys just worship a lot. Well, we're grateful. He died for us. How do we, how do we show our gratitude? I, you know, I can't uh, buy him a, a sandwich. You know, he's in heaven, but I can worship him. I can honor him and I can magnify him. It's the least we can do is to lift up our voice. And from our own heart, from our own soul, great is the Lord. Hallelujah. To be magnified and glorified in all the earth. Hallelujah. Jesus lifted up. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. You know, we, we're going to be singing songs forever. A lot, oftentimes people think, well, we're just going to worship during that thousand years. No, but you're going to want to worship all the time. When you see Him, you'll go, you know, I know we're doing other things during that thousand years. We've got duties, but you'll want to go stop the duties because I've got to lift my hands up. I've got to magnify Him. I've got to glorify Him. I can't help but praise Him, for He has done great things. Holy is His name. Hallelujah. 
Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen, amen. Well, I guess you can be seated. Thank you, guys. Give the band a hand. Praise the Lord. You guys do such a great job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I like that guitar, too, man. That's so awesome. Praise the Lord. I try to watch him uh, make those moves on that guitar and, uh, and pray that one day I would be able to do that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Hey, thanks for coming back on Sunday night. I know you're busy. People have a lot of stuff going on, but we're, we're so close to the catching away of the saints, of the rapture of the church, that it's fitting that we come and, and come to church more than normal. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we, uh, I believe we'll have badges in our ha house in heaven. Like, we went to church on Sunday nights, <laughs> went to church on Wednesday nights. There'll be little things in your house. It'll be a reminder of your faithfulness because you're communicating you love him. You're communicating your love. If you're married and you never want to spend time with your spouse, you might want to work on your marriage a little bit. <laughs> Amen? Well, you're spending time with the Lord coming to church. You're communicating to Him you love Him. And your actions preach for you. Uh, if you're really hungry, you'll come. And there's something John Lake said about hunger. He said, if there's anything... Listen, John Lake said, if there's anything I could pray for the believer, that'd be that they would hunger for God. Because there's something about hunger, man. It'll make you climb over a mountain. It'll make you do whatever. So we, we hunger for Jesus. And you know, it's my prayer this afternoon when I was praying for you that Jesus would be unveiled to you in a new way. That you, you would see him high and lifted up with his train filling the temple. That there'd be a, a realization about him redeeming you from the curse of the law. That you'll see that he purchased you and how you take part in what He did for you. You command it in your own life, and, and you bring to pass everything that He did for you. All full scope, full scope, full scope. If you got trouble with your mind, the chastisement of our peace. He was berated mentally, so you don't have to be berated mentally. His back was ripped wide open, so you, you can be healed. <laughs> he said, what's easier to say? Your sins be forgiven, or rise, take up your bed, and walk. Hallelujah. It's all done at the same time. So what a redemption we have in Christ. So that's why we worship. I'm still explaining why we, we spend time worshiping, because we're, we're, we're appreciative. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Well, uh, tonight, you know, we'll unveil this Antichrist. We'll have some... No, I'm just kidding. We'll do some crazy things like that. No, I say that because the guys on TV will say that, and I'm like, wait a minute, come on. You know, the Bible's real clear about him not being revealed until we leave, we depart. You have so much authority, he can't even come on the scene until you leave. So uh, we're blessed. So we'll get into some of that tonight. You know, I have a lot of things that I like to preach on. If you could say, Joe, what, if you could preach on anything you want to preach on tonight, I'd preach on the name of Jesus. I'd preach on the power of God because there's such a preach to it. Uh, you know, because sometimes to me, end times get so uh, in, much information, but the Lord pretty much says, you know, you feel that unction. He wants everybody to know how close it is. Why would He want that for you? He wants you happy. He wants you excited. He wants you expectant. Your strength will be tied to your joy. And you talk about something that brings joy, all of a sudden you're going to see Jesus. Come on, man, there's nothing cooler. Uh, you can tell somebody they won the lottery, whatever. You're about to see Jesus, that's way cooler than winning the lottery. Come on. Amen. Amen. Come on. And, and the folks going home to be with the Lord, it's so hard on us, but for them, they're having the time of their life. Oh, come on. I mean, so uh, we're so privileged that so soon we'll be there with Him. So this morning we got into some of the signs of the coming of the Lord. I think we got through about 10 or 15. There's about 55 or 60 I've got an End Times book coming out supposedly this fall. They're working on the cover. They're working on all this other stuff right now. But it has 55 or 60 signs of the coming of the Lord in our generation. Uh, so uh, it's, it's blatant. It's exact. It's precise. We're so privileged to have so much information. Almost information overload. But what it preaches to us is so soon we'll see Him. So there's an acceleration. How do we respond? We hear preaching that Jesus is coming. There's an acceleration to the will of God for your life. So we don't fit church into our life. It is our life. And I know we hear that, but it really is. You're going to be so glad. I, I tell you, you're going, to, you're going to get to heaven and go, man, thank you, Jesus. I went to church when sometimes other folks didn't. And uh, you're, you're showing your love for him. Hallelujah. So let's, let's pick up where we left off. You know, I have things I want to get into. But we'll just see what, what route we take. And uh, we'll be strengthened. We'll be blessed. You know, there's all this pressure sometimes. Thank God for Kenneth Hagin. There's all this pressure to preach on something new. And, uh, you know, Brother Hagin taught on Mark 11, 23 and 24, every service I went to from 1970 when I first heard him, to probably about 78 or 79, and I thought, dear Lord, is that all that man knows is Mark 11, 23 and 24? <laughs> but, you know, it's a commission for us to get. We have what we say. So it took, you know, it, I thank God he didn't bend to the pressure to make it real flashy. He just taught the Word, taught the Word, taught the Word, taught the Word. Now, I, I talk about him because he's a, a man that finished his course. 
You know, I, I follow people that finish their course. I don't follow people that, uh, that don't finish their course. So uh, I look at Brother Hagen because he, he did exactly what he was called to do. So we're privileged tonight, so privileged. I went to Rama 41 years ago. I went to my 40th reunion or whatever it was this last February. There wasn't very many people there, and, and uh, everybody's pretty old. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm just saying, I looked around and thought, I am old. What's going on here? So uh, it, was, it was good, though. It was good to see everybody come together, and I can't believe that, that Rama started in 74. So uh, we're all blessed by that, and I talk about that because uh, I, I think of Brother Hagen. I look at Brother Copeland. I look at other ministers. They all look to Brother Hagen and, uh, uh, for, for the, the, the sticking to the word. Not moved by what we feel, not moved by what we see, moved by what the Word says about us. Hallelujah. Amen. And when it comes to end-time preaching, I heard a lot of stuff today from different friends of mine text me, some different stuff was being preached, you know. And it's amazing. If you don't look at who you are in Christ, if you don't look at end-time preaching through the lens of who you are in Christ, you'll feel like you don't qualify. Amen. So, so it's, it's, it needs to be taught properly so we know that it brings great joy. So let's pray. We'll get right into it. There's a lot to get into. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for everyone that came, Father. Thank you for blessing them. I thank you their households are blessed, their jobs are blessed. And Lord, what we, we've set our hand to the plow in this hour, Father, to yeah. have that which heaven would have for us. You're right here at Cornerstone. We thank you for amplifying your voice through this church, Lord. Thank you for, for uh, absolute signs and wonders to be wrought in the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Demonstrations of the resurrection. Operations of the Spirit. Things showing forth the way and the plan and the purpose of God in this hour. So I thank you for great strength for every believer in this room, Lord. A supernatural endowment of revelation, insight, that we, we know the hope of our calling. I thank you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, that we'd have more reverence for you, Jesus. We'd lift you up. Thank you, thank you, thank you for dying for us. When, and when it comes to all this information about your return, help us uh, see how close we are so that we can make adjustments, we can make changes, and we can have great joy. We thank you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody said amen. Go back there to Luke 21. We'll pick back up there. And I want to kick back into making sure that you look at end time preaching through the lens of who you are in Christ. Uh, for instance, like today, I heard of someone preach something that was a little bit weird. And, um, and I try to preach this as much as I can. Like the ten virgins. We all hear that. And people preach, well, if you don't have oil in your lamp, you're not going up in the rapture. He's not talking to the church there. He's talking to the world. He's talking to Jewish boys there before the resurrection. And they need oil in their lamp. After the resurrection, you're him. Would Jesus need oil on his lamp? No, you're him, okay? And I know that freaks people out and it gets quiet when you say that because I hear pre preachers preach, if you don't have your wick just right, you're not going up in the rapture. Still quiet again, so let me go a little further. <laughs> no, see, once after the resurrection, you get born again, you're him. I might be the hangnail, I might be the, the little finger, I might be the little toe, but I'm still in the body. Amen. So, so you're blessed. You, you qualify. Why do you qualify? He purchased you. That's why it's called redemption. Has nothing to do with what we've done. Has everything to do with what the Lord's done. And Jesus is real here, clear in Luke here. In Luke 21, we're going to get into the a review of this morning. But he said, pray that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. I don't have to pray to be accounted worthy. I am worthy. Amen. So notice the tone changes before the resurrection and after the resurrection. Before the resurrection, he's fulfilling the law flawlessly. He's having to do that. After the resurrection, there is no law. It's, it's grace. So we're blessed. He sees you through corrective lenses. They've been stained in the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Oh, come on. He looks at you. He sees you complete in Him. Amen. He's already presented you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Come on. He, the, he blotted out the handwritings and the ordinances that were contrary to you and laid them and nailed them to the cross. He disarmed Satan. Just like right now, Israel's disarming Iran. The last couple of days they've been doing cyber attacks all over Iran because Iran's trying to, they're getting close to getting a missile. Our Secretary of State said that, that Iran is weeks away from getting a nuclear weapon. So Israel's been blowing things up all over, all over Iran. They're disarming Iran so Iran can't hurt them. Jesus disarmed Lucifer so he has nothing to fire at us. The devil goes, You're, you just don't quite measure up. And I go, sorry about that. The blood of Jesus made me perfect. Come on. Nah, 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 nah. Right. <laughs> As he is, so are we in this world. So the tone changes. I, I say that because I'm not trying to be ornery. I'm just saying that. Why not enjoy the blessings of redemption? Who, who am I to not walk in the fullness of it? Hey, that's, that's arrogance to say I'm not going to walk in the fullness of it. No, I'm going to humble myself. And if he made me perfect, I'll say I'm perfect. 
Hallelujah. So go to Luke 21. You pick out the verse here. We'll see if you're flowing. Come on, verse 24. He says in verse 24, They'll fall by the edge of the sword, and they'll be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem will be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, in my Bible, I marked 70 A.D. right there. Why? Because that's when that happened. Jerusalem was overthrown in 70 A.D. Notice how flawless the Bible is. Jesus was born in 2 B.C., went to the cross on 30 A.D., one generation, exactly 40 years later, Jerusalem's overthrown. That's a big deal because you got, you got uh, Brother Hagen born in 1917. You got Allenby going into Israel in 1917. One jubilee, 50 years later, Jerusalem's won back. Everything's on a very, very flawless clock. I hear people saying, well, it's all adjusted. No, man, they're called Moeds. They're set times. In the fullness of time, Jesus came. In the fullness of time, He's going to come back again. So the fullness of the Gentiles is pretty much done when Jerusalem's won back. Pretty amazing. It's amazing that everything revolves around Jerusalem. <laughs> Won't it be something that we're going to see the king right there? You remember at the second coming, the Bible says there's a great earthquake right there where the temple mount is, and there'll be a cross that will form. The valley will split like this and split like that. It'll be a perfect cross. And the water from the, the Dead Sea is going to come right by Jesus, and it'll go out into all the earth and quicken all the waters in the earth. It gets near Jesus, and it comes alive. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, you know what? Jesus is not near you. He's in you. Amen. Come on. Hallelujah. So you're, you're a carrier of the glory of God. Hallelujah. So then he goes a little further here and gets into detail in verse 29. He spake to them a parable. What's the parable for? To make what he had just said make sense or be clearer because that's pretty extreme to go, hey, when you see this one event, time's up. That's pretty bold. So watch what he does to clarify that. He says in verse 29, look at the fig tree. That's the nation of Israel. Notice uh, Hitler killed six million Jews right before Israel is regathered as a nation. Wow. The devil thinking he could stop the will of God from being wrought. Couldn't do it. You want to hear what's crazy? Uh, there's, about nine, there's exactly 9 million Jews in Israel right now. Now hang with me. I can't believe I'm going to get into this. We'll go, this is called bonus night. Hallelujah. We'll get into every, a little bit of everything. Zechariah 13 says that God will bring a, a third of them through the fire. Two-thirds of Israel is going to die. So they're going to have another 6 million die during the tribulation. As Zechariah 13 tells you exactly how many Jews are going to get killed. One third is going to make it through. The other two thirds aren't going to make it through. And that's exactly the same number as the Holocaust in the 40s. I mean, that's sobering. That's so sobering. Thank God we were grafted in. Thank God He, he brought the Gentiles in. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. That, they missed the will of God for their nation. You know what? It wasn't murder. It wasn't adultery. You know, what it was, you know how they missed it? Uh, complaining. They missed the will of God, rose up the Gentiles because he got tired of his own family complaining so much. So it's amazing. In the Old Covenant, you can kill people, you can do whatever. The Lord's like, hey, I'll forgive you. You go to complain, he's like, I'm done. <laughs> it's like the, the end of his mercy. He's like, shut up, quit complaining. So God uh, brought up the Gentiles. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So let's go a little further. There, we'll get into the timing for a minute here and we'll keep moving because we've got a lot to get into tonight. Verse 30, when they now shoot forth or bud, you see and know of your own selves that summer or harvest is nigh at hand. Likewise, in the same manner, when you see these things come to pass, run for the woods and freak out. No. I mean, that's what people have taught. You know, it's going to be bad. Everybody's going to be fried in the streets. You know, he's, Jesus is coming back, going to kill everybody. No, he said, I'm coming back and my reward is with me. Did I miss somebody? Is everybody, everybody with me? Come on. <laughs> no, you know, people have this tendency to think how bad it's going to be. For, for the world, it's horrible. For the world, it's absolutely horrible. But there's going to be pressure on them to receive Jesus. Thank God for that. It's just like Moses and Pharaoh. They're going to have the exact same miracles. What? To change their heart because their hearts are so hardened. So the Lord's so sweet, He's going to send some flash and fireworks. I've said it every time I'm here. You've got seven years of fireworks coming. What? To get people's attention. You know, in high school when I was dating girls, I had a certain spot I pulled over. I told you, every, every day I'd pull over this one spot. I'd open up the trunk and I'd pull out fireworks. And I'd shoot Roman candles off the back of my car. So I could say, I, you can't say you didn't go out and you didn't see fireworks. <laughs> you do what you got to do, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Whatever it takes, praise the Lord. But every girl couldn't say, well, I never saw fireworks when I was out with him. Yes, you did. I shot them right there, right off. So... So, so you, you see the earth getting ready for this, man. It's like the earth's getting ready for the seven years. And I mean, there's an asteroid that NASA has labeled wormwood in the year 2029. 
I was preaching in the Ukraine talking about signs of the coming of the Lord. And, and I talked about wormwood. This is 25, 30 years ago. And everybody gasped. I said, well, what's the deal with wormwood? It's the word Chernobyl in their Bible. Yeah. So if, we were talking about today. If you looked at the asteroid sites on, online, NASA has one set up showing you the dates and times of all the asteroids that they've seen. doesn't even show you the ones that they find out after the fact. This last year has been asteroid after asteroid after asteroid that they go, wow, it, it, it was a near miss, it was a near miss, it was a near miss. There were three in a row. One was 180,000 miles, the other one was 18,000 miles, and the other one was 1,800 miles. What's the combination of those three? Six, six, six. Three sixes equal 18. I'm like, dear Lord. So, I mean, it's, 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 this is happening right in front of our eyes. So let's go a little further because we, we're, we got this is just review, praise the Lord. <laughs> you guys are so kind. I wanted to thank you again. I don't do it enough. Thanks for being so hungry. Man, your hunger will let the Lord say things to us that, we, that will help us answer questions and strengthen us. So thank you for being hungry. Hallelujah. Amen. So look, now he goes here in verse 31. Likewise, when you see these things come to pass, no, 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 that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation, what generation? The one that sees Israel regathered and Jerusalem won back, shall not pass away till all is fulfilled. He goes, heaven and earth will pass away. Actually, in the Greek, it's the word altered. Heaven and earth will be altered, but my words will not be altered. Wow. And then he says, take heed to yourselves, lest at any times your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, so that day comes upon you unaware. So well, look how Jesus says this here. You can be living when Israel's regathered. You can be living when Jerusalem's on back and still be unaware. So he warns us there in the Message Bible. It says, don't let the sharp edge of your expectation get dulled by shopping. You can get so busy doing stuff that your sharp edge of your expectation gets dulled. Why would he want you to have a sharp edge of your expectation? When you believe the Lord's coming back, it changes your life. Come on, Come on you live different, you're nicer, you're sweeter, you're kinder, you're holy. If you think Jesus is coming tonight, I would pray we would think differently tonight. I guarantee if you knew Jesus was coming tonight, you'd go to bed like this. Lord, I'm going to take a little shut eye, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do right here before I go to sleep. I love you. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be raising hands. You'd be raising your feet. You'd be staring. You'd get your hair and pull your hair up like this. I'm going to bless you, Lord, because I know I'm going to see you tomorrow. If we had any brains, that's what we do. Come on. Amen. In other words, if you got some brains, you'd go, I'm about to meet God. Come on. Think about that. If you got brains and you go, I'm about to meet God, it'll alter you. Oh, come on, man. You talk about eyes as a flame of fire, feet like undefined brass. I'll, I'll give you some here. You know, the Lord told me, appeared to me in 87, told me to preach on the coming of the Lord. I said, I don't want to do that. He said, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> appeared to me again three years later, and all he did was look at me. Man, all love, uh, white robe, olive sash. I'm standing, sitting there in this office up in Michigan. He's standing right there, and he wasn't critiquing me, wasn't judging me. Here, I hadn't even done what he told me to do. And he's like, I love you just the way you are. Man, the next church I went to, I ran up and down the pews preaching on the coming of the Lord. Because I, I, I don't want to disappoint him. So if we, if, we, if we know we're about to see him, we don't want to disappoint him. He's not mad at you, not frustrated with you. When he appeared to me like that, I hadn't done what he told me to do. And it was all love, no critiquing whatsoever. Amen. Zero critiquing. Amen. <laughs> We, we don't even know what that look looks like. We're so, religions made us go, well, you don't quite measure up. He looked at me like, I love you just the way you are. Everything's cool. Well, man, the, the goodness of God led me to repentance. Hallelujah. Amen. So, so changes. We learn, we learn all this stuff because it, it's time to change and make alterations. All right, so let's run through them. We went through them this morning. We're going to go through them because we've got to get moving what we're going to get into. You've got Israel reestablished as a nation in 1948. You've got Jerusalem on back in, in 1967. Then you got the Hebrew language restored. You got the Ethiopian Jews brought back. You got the fertility of the land of Israel. You got the revival of the Roman Empire. You, you've got uh, the Temple Mount Institute. You got foxes showing up on the Temple Mount. You got fish showing up in the Dead Sea. You got the ritual baths around the Temple Mount filling up with water. Um, this just keeps going. You got the birds, 172 different species of predatory birds. I went to the San Diego Zoo right after that happened, and I was taking my daughter and son-in-law, and I said, I went up to this lady, and I said, how many predatory bird species do you have? She goes, oh, about five or 600. I said, what? Because when I heard that 172, I thought that's not possible. And this lady, this lady at the San Diego Zoo said, no, there's not 172, there's five or 600. God's got them in position for the cleanup of, of Israel uh, in place. So if, if birds can get in position, the Temple Mount Institute in position, Russia in position, how much more you and I? Come on, what's, what's the church doing? We're like, we're all in. Hallelujah. Amen? 
So you have all these signs. There's many more than you had the signals. You had the blood red moons. You got all that stuff happening. Uh, it's to make us aware. Yeah. It's not to scare us. It's not to freak us out. It's to make us aware. When you're driving down the freeway and you see a sign, you know, it says Washington D.C. 150 miles. You go, oh my God! That sign freaked me out. No, the sign's information to show you how close you are to Washington, D.C. All these shines show us how close we are to the coming of the Lord. They're not to scare us. They're not to freak us out. They're to make us aware. Like if, you're, if you see a McDonald's sign that says eight miles, you're going to get your quarter pounder with cheese, large fries, and Diet Coke. Eight miles away, you don't go, I'm never going to get my quarter pounder. No, you know, in about seven minutes, six minutes, the way I drive, maybe five minutes. You're going to get your quarter pounder, Amen. So think about that. The signs show you uh, how close you are to bring you relief. Oh good, oh good, I'm almost there. Oh good, oh good, I'm almost there. Oh good, oh good, you're almost there. Amen. You're about to be raptured. So that's what we'll get into. Let's get into this. Man, there's been a lot of weird preaching in the last couple of years about the rapture. All these people are like, well, you know, it's the doctrine that came about. In every college, this is what they say. The rapture is a weird doctrine that came about from this crazy lady from the 1800s. The doctrine of the rapture of the church didn't come from some lady in the 1800s. It came from Paul. Jesus said, I, Paul said, I got it face to face from Jesus. I got it directly from him about the catching away of the saints. So let's get into all this. And uh, if, if we've heard it some before, it's good to have another meal of it, you know. I've had a cheeseburger. I like cheeseburgers again. Come on. Go to 1 Thessalonians. I like what John Osteen said. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He said, you can tell when you've gotten a hold of a verse when you want to hear it over and over and over again. So we'll go to 1 Thessalonians. Now, think about this. Uh, this is the first letter written by Paul. What was the, the, the theme? Coming of the Lord. <laughs> Now, they thought they were in the tribulation because Nero was killing so many Christians. Nero was dipping the Christians in oil and setting them on fire to be nightlights for the city. So they thought, this has to be the tribulation. Paul said, don't worry. The tribulation can't come and the Antichrist can't be revealed until there's a departure of the church. People thought it was a departure from the faith. If a departure from the faith brought the Antichrist, he would have come during the Dark Ages. There, there is a departure from faith that he talks about, but this word is not a departure from the faith. It's the same word that Enoch was taken. It was a departure of Enoch from the earth. So when the church departs, the Antichrist can be revealed. Because you're withholding him right now. You can't have the Christ and the Antichrist here at the same time. The Bible calls you Christ. What concord hath Christ with Belial? So, he, so you're being the body of Christ, whether you're comfortable with it or not, God calls you Him. Amen. Think of how bold we'd be if we got that in us. Come on now. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, so let's go to your first Thessalonians chapter 4. You know the verses so well. Look at verse 13. He says of First Thessalonians chapter 4. Remember, Paul said, while I was with you, he was with him for two weeks. What did he preach on? The coming of the Lord and the, the rapture and the Antichrist. So isn't that something? Being with him for two weeks, that was his theme. He said, Remember while I was with you, I told you these things. So it's amazing how God wants us to learn this so it brings peace. What peace would it bring? You don't have to be here during the tribulation. That's the peace it will bring. Amen. So look here at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and look at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus would God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall come, descend with, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. How cool is that? He says here, Wherefore, because of this, comfort one another with these words. So the teaching of the rapture was to bring comfort that you don't have to be here during the trip. The teaching of the rapture was not to freak people out. It was to bring comfort. And if you really look at that verse there, it's the word exhort. Exhort means to call nearer to God. So when you hear about the rapture of the church, He wants you white hot, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So the teaching on the rapture is to call you closer to Him. That's what exhortation does. When there's exhortation from heaven, it, bring, it makes you lean in and get closer to Him. Just like you know, when you're engaged. How many of you when you're engaged to your spouse, did you talk more, not less? 
Colleen and I talk so much, we almost burned phones up. She's living in California. I was living in Tulsa. I was like, my phone's about to catch on fire. Why, you're engaged. You love each other. You want to talk more. And with Jesus, you want to talk more, not less. That's what that word means. Exhort, call nearer to God. So, so teaching on the rapture calls you nearer. So I've heard people go, well, the, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Yes, it is. In the, in the New Testament here where it says we'll be called up, it's the word harpazo. That's the same word that Elijah, talking to Elisha, the sons of the prophets, told Elisha, don't you know that your master will be taken from you? That's the word harpazo. But you know what the word for it there is in the Latin, the first translation of the New Testament? It's rapture, rapture. So the word rapture is right there in Latin. So I don't know why people will fight for the right to go, that's not in the Bible. Well, Enoch was raptured. <laughs> Elijah was raptured. That's not in the Bible. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Jesus was raptured. The church will be raptured. The two witnesses will be raptured. The great multitude in the tribulation will be raptured. There are several raptures. So it's, God does it. I've even been telling him lately, get your flux capacitor working because we're about to be caught up. Come on, get that stuff in, in set up, man. It's time for us to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Isn't it amazing? The, the shortest amount of time that can't be divided, all of a sudden He's going to say, come up hither, come up to the throne of God, and your body's going to be recreated in, in a time that you can't even divide it so short. Ooh. Glory to God. And all of a sudden you'll never be tired again, never gain weight again. Ooh. You'll have a brand new body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, my weight is perfect. I'm just not the right height. Come on. The stain of Adam's going to be taken off of us. Come on. We're going to be glorified right there. Boom. We're going to rock it up. The voice of the archangel. Remember the Bible says in the Old Covenant that the devil disputed with, uh, 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 over the body of Moses. The, the, the archangel had to talk to the devil. He was disputing with the archangel going, you can't have him because he's on my turf. And the archangel goes, the Lord rebuke you. So at the rapture of the church, you can see the devil go, hey, that, they're on the earth. The earth belongs to me. And the archangel is going to go, the Lord rebuke you. And you watch, all of a sudden, we're going to rock it off the earth, right up into heaven. Woo, glory to God. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Come on. There's an event coming so soon that's going to be the coolest thing that's ever happened to us or ever will happen to us. We'll always look back on, do you remember the day we were raptured? Woo, you bet I do. Glory to God. Man. Uh, we will never be tired, never be bored. Man, what a cool thing the Lord has for us. Uh, there's a specific thing about the church age and the ages to come to show forth His goodness and His kindness to those that first trusted in Him. We trusted in Him when we couldn't see Him. Wow. So we're going to be a part of this ruling uh, race called the church that will rule over all the natural races forever through eternity. You're going to have oversight over people. Amen. So uh, you might as well get ready for it. There's a lot of great things ahead. Right now you're writing your resume for what you'll be doing during the millennium. Oh, amen. <laughs> amen. Oh, Hallelujah. All right, so here, this rapture, what, what a cool thing. I mean, it, it's amazing how there's so much preaching against it right now. It's why? Because we're about to be raptured. <laughs> the, devil, the devil wants to do everything he can to disqualify the truth of the Word. The truth of the Word is you're going to be caught up. So, you know, I remember the old songs, the graves shall burst open. The graves aren't going to burst open. Those people that have already gone home with the Lord, their body's going to be recreated. They're going to go right through the coffin. They're going to right through the earth, and we're going to meet them in the air. Hallelujah. What a reunion coming for all of us. We've all got loved ones that are there. What a great reunion we'll have when we get there. Man, glory to God. Fun things ahead. Fun, fun, fun. And Daddy won't take the T-bird away. Praise the Lord. Amen. So let's talk about several things about the rapture. You know, it, it's an event that's getting ready to happen. I believe we're so close to it. And we'll get into more of that about the timing here in a little bit. But let's talk about the number one purpose for it is that we need a different body. Mm -hmm. This body uh, uh, is basically has the seed of Adam, has the stain of Adam. And he says we're, we're going to put on immortality. The Bible says we long to be clothed upon with our body which is from heaven. And all of a sudden we're going to be, have a brand new body. Because you think about it in the Old Testament. If you, if you look in Exodus 19, God said, Put a fence around the mountain, lest they even get near to gaze at me and die. Not because God's mad at them. He's just so holy and they weren't holy. So He said, Don't even let them look at me. He could kill them. So here you got cherubim and you got seraphim all throughout the Bible. And they're created, Isaiah 6 says, they're created to go around the throne going, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. The whole earth's full of His glory. And they've got to shield themselves from His glory. They're created to be right there. And they have two wings that cover their face, two wings that cover their feet, two wings they fly with. They're created to be there. Still, they've got to shield themselves. Where you're going to get a brand new body so you can walk in and talk to the Lord. 
Wouldn't it be weird every time you go see Daddy, you can't see for a week? I mean, wouldn't that be weird? That'd be odd. I mean, so we're going we're gonna to get a body that can handle that kind of radiance. The Bible says the glory of God that's in the face of Jesus outshines the sun. Didn't say there wouldn't be a sun, said there's no need for it, for the glory that's in Jesus' face. So how many, how many, if you're in a spaceship, you go past the moon, go past Mars, I think I'll go sit on the sun for a little bit. I, I, you know, the closer you get to the sun, you go, it's a little too hot. The sun's the only type you have of God. That's why people worship the sun, because that's a type of what our Father's like. You want to see what He's going to look like? Go out some afternoon when you've got shafts of light coming through the clouds from the sun. That's a picture of what your dad's going to look like. You're going to look at those shafts of light coming out of His face. Coming out of his face. The Bible says in Hosea, there was the hiding place of His power. Shafts of light are shooting out of His side. Ezekiel said He's a fire from the loins up and a fire from the loins down. Woo, come on. The one who was, the one who is, and is to come. Well, all of a sudden, man, we're going to get this body so we can walk in there and talk to him and not walk around for six months. Hey, where are you at? No, we're, we're going to get some glorified bodies so our eyes can handle it. Won't that be wonderful? Hallelujah. And we've talked about this. We know this. Let's go to the Scripture. If we want to get answers, we always go to the Bible. The Word gives you complete, clear pictures of what it'll be. Remember when Jesus was raised from the dead? You remember on the road to Emmaus? What a wonderful story. Don't you love that he, he, their eyes were holding to who He was? Don't you love how cool the Lord is? They, he doesn't let them know who He is. He's walking along with them. First thing they, He said to them after the resurrection, Why are you guys so sad? And they said, Well, haven't you lived around here? They crucified our Lord. The Bible says he would have kept right on walking, but they constrained him to stay for dinner. They sat down with him. He took them through the Word. Physically in their presence, they don't know who he is, he took them through Christ in the Old Testament and showed them himself. Wow. Then all of a sudden he broke bread and then disappeared. And they said, ooh, that's him. Did not our hearts burn within us the words that he spoke to us? Man, you talk about an Easter lesson. That's the coolest Easter lesson you'll ever hear from Jesus himself. Well, how cool is that? They're so freaked out. They go back and tell their buddies, we saw him, we ate dinner with him, he disappeared. They go, you're crazy. Thomas said, I don't believe you, you're nuts. I, in fact, I won't believe until I see the hole in his side, see the hole in his hands. I will not believe. Jesus walks right through the wall. Thomas, reach hither your hand, thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. He said, my Lord and my God. So here, they freaked out and said, he's a spirit, because that is kind of weird to walk through the wall. I mean, that's bizarre. He walks through the wall, he's a spirit. He goes, no, no, handle me. A spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see I have. So he's in a glorified body, walks through the wall, but still can be handled. And you know, the first thing he said was, do you have any meat? He didn't say, do you have any salad? He didn't say, do you have any broccoli? First thing he said was, where's the beef? So he can walk through the wall, and he still has a normal appetite. He didn't say, you know, think about it. He didn't say, give, 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 give me some green beans. and give me some, I like green beans. He didn't say, give me broccoli. He didn't say, give me kale. Where's the beef? Amen. I, I'm telling you, the number one thing you're going to see, well, I say number one, there's several things we're going to see about the Lord when we get to heaven. Number one, obviously, is his humility. Number two is how normal he is. Everything about him is so cool and so normal and so fun. And he's been portrayed as this guy that's up there in heaven with a fly swatter hitting people. He's the coolest of cool, the normalest of normal. And he walks through the wall and goes, handle me. A spirit hath not flesh and bones, you see I have. He goes, let's have some burgers. Glory to God. What did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. So here he gets a brand new body and that's what it's going to be like. Let's look at the, the, the qualifications. Because man, there's a lot of weird preaching about this. But go to verse 14 and watch the Bible answer our questions. Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So the qualification there to go up in the rapture is to be in Christ. Now, you know, people are saying, I hear people say, well, if you do not have faith for the rapture, you won't go up. The rapture is not about you. The rapture is about him getting his body. So if you're in the body, you're going up. He's coming back for a certain species. And if you're in that species, you're going up whether you like it or not. I heard people go, well, what if they don't want to go up in the rapture? It don't matter. He's going to seize them. That's what that word rapture means. He's going to seize them. If they're in the body, they're going up whether they want to or not. You go, I don't believe that. Well, you'll find out. I mean, if you want to, if you want to get to reading it correctly, that's what it says. He's God. He purchased you, and He's coming back for you. It, like if I didn't have my leg, you know, what if I was up here preaching without my leg? I'd be looking forward to getting my leg back. Jesus is looking forward to getting His body. 
we've made it about us. Am I cool enough? And I've told you what this lady said to me in Galveston one time. She said, how dare you say that if you're born again, you're going up? And I, I tried to use scripture to help her. I go, you know, the word's pretty clear about it. She was real sweet, but she was kind of bold about it. And so the Holy Spirit loves to magnify Jesus. Anytime you see Jesus being magnified, you can see the Holy Spirit in action. That's His job is to honor the Son. The Lord said, tell her, ask her, whose works would she rather trust in? Her works or my works? I don't know about you, but my works are filthy rags. But I accepted Jesus and I accepted His works. So guess what? I'm born from above. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what He told Nicodemus. He said, you know, you're, you're going to be born from above. That's what we are. We're born again. Amen. Glory to God. So He's going to say, come up, come up hither, come up to the throne of God. Boom. We're going to go rocketing up to heaven. Wow, hallelujah. We'll go to the, there'll be a meet and greet, I'm sure. Then we'll go to the reward seat of Christ. Then we'll go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know how long the marriage supper of the Lamb is supposed to be? That's a year-long meal. Yeah. You've been to a meal that's two or three hours. thought, man, this is a long meal. How'd you like to go to a meal that's a week? How'd you like to go to a meal that's two weeks? How'd you like to go to a meal that's three weeks? How'd you like to go to a meal that lasts a year? Yeah. Woo, glory to God. I guess we'll probably get to try everything that ever was or ever will be. <laughs> I don't know. Amen. Maybe, maybe there'll be portions of it different than that, but we'll see. So here, we got all this. We got the qualifications. What about the timing? This is something that I, I don't know why we weren't taught until recently about this, but uh, the only little hidden reference in the Gospels to the rapture is hidden, clothed, but cloaked, in, in, because the, the, the Gospels only show second coming. Get that in your mind for a minute. The Gospels only show second coming. But there's one little hidden reference in John. Remember he said, In my Father's house are many mansions, or if we're not so, I would have told you. He goes, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also, and, and I'll come again and receive you unto myself. When he said that, that was a Jewish man's way of saying to a woman, Will you marry me? So Jesus basically just asked his staff to marry him, they'd be engaged. I'm sure they all almost sat there like, Wait a minute, this dude's uh, uh, proposing to us. Because guys don't propose to guys, amen? So here, they're thinking, he's having out the sun too long, he just asked us to marry him. Well, what would happen in the Jewish culture? A man would ask a woman to marry him, they'd be betrothed. The man would go back to the father's house, the father would oversee the building of a honeymoon suite, and the father would tell the son when the room is ready, and he could go back and get his bride. The bride would know about exactly to the day almost when they would come. I, I interviewed... All these ladies in Israel, I go, how would you know how close it was for him to come? She said, well, there's several reasons. Number one, we knew how much money they had, so it was going to be, depending on how much money they had, it was going to be how elaborate the room is. Other than that, word would come to them almost every day how far along the room is. She said, well, we didn't want to spend five or $600 on perfume, and it was six more months. They said, we knew almost to the day. You know why Paul said, you are not in darkness, that that day would overtake you as a thief? You'll have revelation of how close you are. Just like in a wedding proposal in the Jewish culture, the father would tell the son, your room is ready, and with a shout he runs back, and she runs out to meet him. She, every lady I talked to said, I, we would know almost to the day. Why is that a big deal? Oh man, this is way too much information, but hang with me. It's going to be on Feast of Trumpets, because guess what Feast of Trumpets says? Feast of Trumpets means, okay? Mm. Oh, hang with me, hang with me, hang with me. Mm. That when Jesus said, of that no man know the day or the hour that I'm coming back, he was telling them, I'm coming back for you on Feast of Trumpets. To them, that was code. Why? Because Feast of Trumpets was on the 29th, it was on the new moon, on the 29.5th day of the month. So the Sanhedrin would send two witnesses out to see the new moon, because you didn't know if it was on the 29th, or you know if it's going to be on the 30th. So the Feast of Trumpets is a two and a half to three day period. So that's why Jesus was saying it, the rapture will be on a point where you'll know two or three days away how close you are. I'm telling you that two or three days before the rapture of the church, you'll go, oh my God, it's this year. And it will not surprise you. The, when the world, hang with me, when the world, I'm quoting the Bible right here, when the world says peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. As a woman in travail, they shall not escape. But you, my beloved brethren, are not in darkness that that day would overtake you as a thief. The Bible says it won't surprise you. It'll be a surprise to the world. Everyone's taught this like the surprise of the Lord's coming. That's the second coming they're talking about. The rapture of the church. Just like how many of you uh, got surprised by your wedding? Boom, I'm married. No, that's weird. You have saved the date. There's work you do. I've never seen somebody wake up and go, I just got married. No, there's preparation. I mean, hello, there's preparation. There's all kinds of stuff to get ready for. That's a picture of the rapture of the church. 
Did any of you get taken by surprise when you got married? Wouldn't that be weird? What happened to you? I don't know. I think I just got married. What do you mean you think you just got married? You know if you just got married. Come on. There's preparation. My daughter, when she got married, we had a, a what do you call that, where you go to another place uh, get, to get married? We're in California. Destination. There you go. Destination wedding. We had nine bridesmaids. My daughter goes, all you got to do, Dad, is do this and this and this. We labored. I've never worked so hard in all my life. The preparation for that one event... It didn't catch us by surprise. There was great detail involved. Now, I know this goes against everything we've been taught. We've been taught our whole lives. You can't tell when the rapture's going to be. And hang with me. The Feast of Trumpets. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. It's the beginning of seven days of awe, mirroring the seven years of tribulation. It's the beginning of a coronation of a king. You have a private ceremony. We go to heaven. Jesus is revealed to us as a king. Then there's a public ceremony. At the second coming, he's revealed to the earth as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. There's all these details about the Feast of Trumpets. Why is that a big deal? This is, God's so cool. He did it so we could understand this. It wasn't so it would be a mystery to us. It would be so we get it. So what? Jesus went to the cross on what feast? Passover. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What was the next feast to be fulfilled? Unleavened bread. Jesus was buried on unleavened bread. What happened on unleavened bread? They took three pieces of bread. The middle piece, they, they folded it, they pierced it, and they broke it. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Born in Bethlehem. You know what Bethlehem means? Home of the bread. So he goes to the cross on Passover, flawless. Buried on unleavened bread, flawless. Raised from the dead on what? First fruits. That's the next feast to be fulfilled. He's raised from the dead. Flawlessly fulfilling the first three. Okay? What's the next one? Pentecost. What happened on Pentecost? The Holy Spirit was poured out. To the day, flawless. What's the next feast to be fulfilled? It's called a Feast of Gatherings. Feast of Trumpets. Rosh Hashanah. It's the Jewish New Year. The church is probably going to go up. I'm not dogmatic about it. It's kind of obvious, but, but there are some other things that you can think about, and that might be on, on Pentecost. Hang with me. You ready for this? I'll give you, I told you it's bonus night. You ready for bonus? We'll do a little Elvis. Here we go. It's bonus night, all right? Enoch was born on Pentecost raptured on Pentecost, the law was given on Pentecost, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit was given on Pentecost. A lot happened on Pentecost. The church started on Pentecost, it could end on Pentecost. Because Jesus fulfilled the first three feasts in three days, He might fulfill the last three Himself, just like He did the first three. That's how segmented the church is. But I don't know about you, every year during Pentecost, I'm giving the Lord a wave offering. <laughs> and every year during Feast of Trumpets, I'm giving Him a wave offering. But I don't have to worry about it, because He said, I'm not in darkness, so that day would overtake me as a thief. Come on. I'll, know, I'll know within a couple of days, man, this is it. You talk about excited. Now, you're not going to go buy a Ferrari on a balloon note. Come on. I mean, you think, can you imagine that? Everybody, everybody thinks, well, if you knew when the Lord's coming, you'd go buy a Ferrari on a balloon note. No, we, you'll be so excited that in the next day or two, you're going to get ready to go to heaven. You won't even think about it. Ferrari will have no tie on you. Right. Amen. And I might be tempted. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. Come on, be, it's going to be, you got something a whole lot better than a Ferrari. You better see Jesus. Mm, 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 mm. Think about that, all of a sudden to be caught up. So there's all this information that's being taught right now about the rapture that's completely law-oriented and that completely produces fear. Well, if you don't have enough oil in your lamp, you don't have this, don't have that, and, and, and we're Him. We're about to be taken from this place to that place. Amen. Glory to God. How cool is that going to be? So let's get into a couple things here before we get into the last part, and that is what we should focus on. There's so much about the rapture you can get into. But there's so much we should focus on, and that is the reward seat of Christ. We should really be preaching on that probably more than anything because it's been preached incorrectly for so long because it was called the judgment seat of Christ. That's what's in the Bible, but that's a mistranslation. The Greek word is the word bima. It means reward seat. Just like we got the Olympics happening right now you know, in Japan, uh, you know, think about all those guys that train. When they go up on the podium, they get a gold, silver, or bronze. I've never seen somebody that trained all that time. They go, I've got to go up on the podium and get my bronze. And like, no, they're excited. They go up there, and then they roll down the flag from their country and play their national anthem. So all of a sudden, you're representing your country uh, competing like that. 
and they're blessed to get a gold, silver, or bronze. What's going to happen right after the rapture of the church? We'll have a huge meet and greet. It'll be the coolest thing to get to see our family and friends and gather like that. The next thing we're going to go to is called the reward seat of Christ. All of a sudden, fire is going to hit your life, and it's going to expose the motives of your heart. It will not expose sin. Sin was already paid for and laid on Jesus. You'll not be judged for your sin, but all of a sudden the fire is going to hit your life just to examine your life. For what you did for the Lord, did you do it to be seen of men, or did you do it because you love the Lord? So isn't it wonderful? The motives of your heart are going to be revealed right there. Fire will hit your life, and all of a sudden uh, wood, you'll either have wood, hay, and stubble, which we don't want, <laughs> or gold, silver, and precious stones. You don't want to get to heaven. The angels go back up. Look at this. It's going to be the biggest bonfire you've ever seen. I, mean, I, 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 don't want, I don't want to get up there on that seat. And all of a sudden the angels are going, everybody take five steps back. Oh, Jesus. Kaboom! Uh, what was that? I mean, you don't want people talking about what happened when the fire hit your life. But notice the, the three things that get them caught on fire, wood, hay, and stubble. That's all above the ground. It's what people see you do. You probably won't get a reward for. The gold, silver, and precious stones are all things of the heart. It's the hidden things of the heart that he's going to make manifest right there. The Bible says the day will declare it. What you've done for the Lord is going to preach for you right there. Woo, hallelujah. And the gold, silver, and precious stones, you will adorn yourself with your gold and silver and the precious stones. The priest would go into the presence of God with those stones on his chest. In the millennial reign of Christ, you'll be wearing your faithfulness. Your robes will be indicative of how faithful you were. You'll have contrasting stitching right here that shows that you came on Sunday nights. There'll be another stitch right here showing you came on Wednesday nights. There'll be another stitch showing that you were faithful. There will be another stitch showing... You'll look at someone's robe and go, Oh my God, you, you, you gave it your all. Just like in the military right now, you see a purple heart, you know they got wounded. You see different badges that represent valor. It's called fruit that they're wearing on their chest. I've never seen a general. I've never seen a general walk on the airplane and go, "Check it out! Got four stars right here! Woo! Woo! It's all over me! I'm exalted!" No, I've never. I've never seen. A general doesn't have to do that. His uniform preaches for him. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I mean, it preaches for him. There's an honor, and there's a respect for that that uniform he's wearing. Well, you're going to be clothed with glory and honor. That word from Daniel, that word means regal. When a, when a military officer would put his regal uniform on, it's to show off his fruit. You don't want to be operating in the millennium in a Speedo bathing suit. Come on, man. You know, I, th- I think of my dad. I mean, my dad, bless his heart, he, he got sick, had a st- uh, stroke. He got, led him to the Lord in the hospital, goes home to be with the Lord. He, he ain't got no robes, man. I'm going to be borrowing robes and throwing them on my dad. I mean, can you imagine? You'll be able to look at people and tell how faithful they were. You, you won't be jealous. You won't look at John Wesley and go, man, I wish I had his robe. No. You'll look at John Wesley's robe and you'll go, wow. You know why? He said, give me ten men that hate sin and love God and I, I will change the world. He said, let God set you on fire. People will come watch you burn. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. So, so we're getting ready. I mean, the amazing thing I'm talking about right now is you're going to remember these words. It's just about to happen. You're just about to be caught up. You're just about to go to the reward seat of Christ. And everything you ever did, you know, we, we are so busy. I mean, things that you do that are unselfish, the Lord re- remembers them all. And the things that we did from the wrong motive, He's going to burn them up right there. But the things with the correct motive, you'll have a memory of it and uh, to honor you for eternity. Wow. You'll wear your jewelry and go, check that out, gold, silver, precious stones, because you did the will of God. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He wants to bless you. He wants to honor you. You'll never suffer humiliation. He was humiliated for you. Amen. Woo, hallelujah. So, but we need to talk about this because this is our next appointment. <laughs> and it's probably the most important appointment that we have because it, it makes you examine your life. So however much time we have left, man, let's hustle. Let's go for it. I want some stitching somewhere. I don't want a word right here on my sleeve that says moron. No, I don't want that. Man, did you see that? Did you see Joe's sleeve? It says moron. No, I don't want moron on my sleeve. Come on, I want, I want something that shows we did the will of God. He's not looking for your perfection. He's just looking for your availability. So you've availed yourself on Sunday night. So let's go look at a little bit more, then we'll close. Run over to Daniel. I know we, we do this a lot, but this is going to show you... Well, these are some of the coolest verses in the Bible. It's going to show you that you can't be here during the trib. Because, you know, you want to kick over some of these sacred cows, because I hear people go, well, now the tribulation, you have to go through that to purify you. 
Well, if that was true, you'd have to resurrect every generation and make them go through the trib to be purified. Come on, that's a good point. And it's also it, it's saying the blood of Jesus didn't do quite a good enough job. Right. All those doctrines downplay how powerful the blood is. Come on. <laughs> Amen. I had a lady, I walked into this one church, she said, you know, I felt like they just had a preacher preach on end times, and I, don't, I won't mention his name, but she said, you know, I feel like if I drink the wrong coffee, I'm not going up in the rapture. <laughs> You know, because it was all law. And I said, well, you know what? I, I didn't get a bad strain of the blood of Jesus. His, the strain I got made me perfect. Yeah. Oh, I think I'll dance on that one. Ooh, come on. Mm, mm, mm. All right, go to Daniel. You got your Bibles there? Run to Daniel. Remember, it's good to write in your Bible. Remember, dirty Bible, clean Christian. Come on. <laughs> clean Christian, clean Bible, dirty Christian. Come on, look at everybody's Bibles. Ooh, spotless. Look at that. Come on. No, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Now, these are some of the coolest verses, and the first part's a little complicated, so I'm going to go and do it slowly for a moment, and then we'll get to the cool part, because they're the coolest verses in the Bible. Look at Daniel 9, look at verse 1. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you the chapter. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. So this is going to show you that you can't be here during the trib. Okay, look at Daniel 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, which was the son of, or whatever that is, which was made... made seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. <laughs> that sounds complicated, but it'll make sense here in a second. He said, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So Daniel's like, okay, we got put into captivity for 70 years. Why? In other words, Daniel was smart enough to go, hey, if we're put in jail, let's find out why. God let them go into captivity. He didn't put them in captivity. He let them go into captivity because they disobeyed him. God told them, let the land rest every seven years. Okay? You're going to be so blessed at the end of six, it'll carry you over into the seventh. Guess how long they fudged and planted on that seventh year? Guess how long they did? 490 years. So God let them go into captivity for what, 70 years? To pay them back what they owe the land. They owe the land exactly 70 years. Okay? How long did they miss it? 490 years. Remember Peter said, how many times do I forgive somebody? Jesus said, 490 times. I guess that was the length of His mercy in the Old Covenant. So hang with me. Gabriel's going to tell Daniel something that's so amazing. Go to verse 23. With all that in mind, they missed it for how long? 490 years. Watch what Gabriel says to Daniel. These verses are the coolest in the Bible. Look at verse 23. Daniel 9, verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth. I am come to show you that you're greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Here we go. Verse 24. Seventy weeks, or seventy segments of seven, or it's another way of saying 490 years. You guys missed it for 490. Gabriel said, God's given you guys another 490. How sweet of him. So what's he say it's for? It's for thy people, the Jews, and upon the holy city, Jerusalem. What for? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and bring an everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Here comes the most coolest verses here in the Bible. Watch this in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, to restore and build Jerusalem until Jesus comes. It's going to be a certain amount of years, and I'm going to add them up for you. So here he said, okay, there's going to be a commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. They'd do proclamations back then. Do, 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 do. King Artaxerxes was talking to Nehemiah. Nehemiah was depressed. He goes, why are you so depressed? King Artaxerxes tells Nehemiah, what are you so depressed about? He goes, Jerusalem's overthrown. He goes, don't worry. I'm going to make a decree that we're going to rebuild Jerusalem. All of a sudden, King Artaxerxes, da, 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 when he made that decree, the clock started. Gabriel said, when that decree goes forth, until the Messiah comes, it's going to be 483 years. Okay? So here Jesus comes on the scene. They said, are you the Messiah? He said, go tell them what you see and what you hear. <laughs> and even John said, go ask him again because they're about to cut my head off. Are you the one? Because it don't look good for me. Jesus said, go tell him what you see and what you hear. He never would come out plainly. But he came riding in on that donkey into Jerusalem. And what did they do? They put those palm branches down. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They said, oh man, don't let them do that. You're admitting you're the Messiah. He didn't say if they didn't do it, the rocks would cry out. Because it was exactly 483 years from that proclamation. God promised them 490 years. 
Jesus came after 483. He owes them seven years of Old Covenant time. That's the seven-year tribulation. He takes the church off the earth and repays them those seven years. It's not for you. It's not for the church. It's for the Jews. The whole people go, I don't understand the book of Revelation. It doesn't matter. You're not supposed to. You're not even here for it. It's a left-behind book for the Jews. Amen. Let me say that again. People go, I just don't understand the book of Revelation. Well, it's pretty easy to understand it. But number one is it's really a playbook for them to go, buckle up. Here comes another trumpet judgment. Here comes another bowl judgment. God's so sweet, He gives them a playbook for what the whole trip's going to be like. So they'll know one by one. They'll know, people would say of that day, that hour, no man knows. They'll know the exact day of the second coming. Why? The, the Antichrist is going to the temple midway through the, the, the tribulation and says he's God. It's an uh-oh moment for the Jews because they think he's the Messiah. Then they know they have exactly 42 months before the second coming. They'll know to the day. So when people say the day and the hour, no man's going to know. They'll know the exact day he's coming. Man, it gets quiet when you say that. But, oh, you got a seven-year period that God's going to deal with the Jews. The spirit of supplication is going to come upon them, and their hearts are going to be turned toward them. And it's just like Joseph. He'll reveal, reveal himself to his brethren at the very end. And, man, it t- talks about it here later. It talks about Israel making a pact with the Antichrist, a covenant for, for seven years. And in the Bible calls it a covenant with death and with hell. And what you see is the Antichrist comes on the scene with a perfect solution for the Palestinian Jewish issue. And right now, you have our Congress, the Democratic Congress, put out a paper last week, a bill to tell Israel they don't, that the West Bank, Judea, and Samaria doesn't belong to Israel. So you watch. All hell's getting ready to break loose because it's going to get crazier for the Antichrist to come on the scene and go, you know what, we've got we to gotta fix this. Right now, you've got different people jockeying for position. Right now, this year, Turkey's President Erdogan said, Jerusalem doesn't belong to Israel, it belongs to us. How insane is that? What if someone from Sweden said, you know, Washington, D.C. doesn't belong to America, it belongs to us. You go, are you crazy? Guess what the Palestinians said this last year? That Big Ben belongs to them, not to England. That's insane, isn't it? Doesn't that just sound like the devil? I just made that up. I mean, it's just, that's just nuts. The Bible says the Antichrist will change dates and times and history. And you see that happening right now. It's, it's right in front of our eyes. They're, they tried to take all, even where Abraham's site was in Israel, they tried to, UNESCO tried to redo it and make it a Palestinian site. It's not a Palestinian site. It's where Abraham's buried. It's Abraham's tomb. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, there is no such thing as Palestinians. <laughs> Newt Gingrich even said that on TV. I thought the guy interviewed him, he was going to swallow his microphone. <laughs> you know why that's a big deal? Hafez Assad, which was Bashar Assad's dad there in Syria. The, one of my buddies was with the Israeli Mossad. He said, you know, we thought we were going to have to kill him. We snuck in, well, I can't believe I'm going to say this. We snuck into his palace and checked his urine and saw that he had prostate cancer and he's going to be dead within six months. He was dead within four months. They didn't have, you imagine that they can go into someone's palace and get their urine? Wow. You know what Hafez Assad said to uh, Yasser Arafat? Now, Yasser Arafat was the guy that started the, the Palestinian Authority, the PLO. He lived in Paris. Guess what his salary was? Get ready for this. The guy who started the Palestinian Authority lived in Paris, not in, 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 in Gaza, not in Israel. He lived in Paris. You know what his salary was? $90 million a year. Hafez Assad told the Yasser Arafat, there are no such thing as Palestinians. They were either Greeks, they were Arabs, they were Turks, or they were Jewish. So an Arab is rebuking the Palestinian Authority, saying, there's no such thing as a Palestinian people. You made that name up. You know where that word came from, Palestine? From uh, uh, David and, and Goliath. You uncircumcised Philistine. It means no covenant. So they, Lucifer named the land no covenant because God said, and I'm giving you a covenant. I swear by my own oath that the land is yours forever. So Lucifer keeps trying to do the opposite of what the Lord's done. But my friend, so soon is the day coming. At the second coming of the Lord, the Bible says he, he obliterates him with the brightness of his coming. There's no negotiation. You'll see at the end of the battle of Armageddon, we're going to come back with Jesus on white horses. And you're going to watch Lucifer freak out. Because Jesus, with the brightness of his coming, obliterates the Antichrist right there. Whew. You talk about every knee bowing. You talk about every tongue confessing that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
So, man, th th we're there. There's, everything is happening right now, which is a setup for what we're getting ready to do, and that's to go to heaven. I mean, I, I, I'm just, I, I, if I could scream it, I do have a helmet with a siren on it, but I didn't bring it. <laughs> I, I would, it would be good to walk around while I'm preaching. If I thought that would help, I'd start doing that. I may get me a bullhorn to start, or a trumpet, start, just to get everybody ready for a trumpet. Think about it. The trumpet's going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise incorruptible. We shall be changed. So what he's told us to do about the rapture of the church, he said, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. <laughs> be ye steadfast. Think about that. Having a steadfast heart right before the rapture. Be ye steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding. Always abounding. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Abounding in what? The work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain with the Lord. So there's something about the attitude just before the rapture is we're always abounding in the work, always abounding in the work, always abounding in the work, always abounding in the work. Your work will be tied to knowing that it's eternal. Just like if you're in the Olympics, wouldn't it be a bummer? Oh, by the, year, by the way, the year that you're in the Olympics, you don't get any medals. No, that'd be a bummer, wouldn't it? No, your, your labor is tied to knowing you're going to get a reward. So talking about the rapture, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. Abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So let's give it our all. Let's have something that's eternal. Let's have some cool stuff on our robes. You know, I, I preached that for years, and, and uh, I got that from the book of Daniel about the regalness of it. Uh, Pastor Scott Webb was telling me there was a guy in his church that died and went to heaven, and the angels were showing him his robe, and he had these silver things down here that were like stripes, and, and they would change color and change. they would move on his, on his robe, and they were indications of his faithfulness. Wow, that's cool. I can't even figure that out. But in the military, you can look at what they're wearing, but you're going to wear some stuff that, that might even change a little bit on your robe. That depending on the way the light hits it, it'll show off what you did for the Lord. Wow. Hallelujah. Amen. God's good, isn't he? So, 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 look at the earth right now. I'm stopping right now, but look at the earth right now. Look at everything that is set up for the changes that are coming. It's blatant. It's in our face. It's like inarguable. You can't ignore it. It's like, my Lord, Jesus is about to come. Amen. I want you to get this. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Not mad at you. Not frustrated with you. He's so excited to get your glorified body. He's so excited to see you. He can't wait to show you your house. You're going you're to go in and go, this is mine? One of my buddies, John Stugart up in Colorado, his mom got, had cancer and went home to be with the Lord. And uh, uh, when I was talking to him on the phone, the glory of God came on me, a tangible anointing to go pray for her. And she didn't understand it, didn't really want it. And uh, so the presence of God showed up there to heal her. Well, she went home to be with the Lord. And John told me about two months after she went home, he had a dream. He's up in heaven with her. And she, he said, oh, don't be sad that I went home. She goes, look at my house. Everything she wanted to do to her house on the earth, she, it was like that in her house in heaven. John said, I, I, he, she showed me the list of everything she wanted on the earth. She goes, look at this. My foyer has this. Look at this. My kitchen has this. In other words, the, the desire of her heart. Amen. So soon, you're going to get to see a manifestation of the desires of your heart. Yeah. And we'll have a great time. We'll come back to the earth and reign for a thousand years, and we'll just, we'll just have eternity. It's going to be fun. So, so Wednesday night, we'll get into a little bit more of that. But we're so soon to be raptured. So make changes. Let's do this. Let's bow our heads for just a minute. It's 725. Uh, I didn't preach too long. Let's just make an assessment of our life. You know, it's just good to kind of recalibrate recalibrate your heart and let's just take a couple seconds here to bow for a moment and let's just ask the Lord to remind us what he told us in the past it's good for us father we we come to you at this point in the service we uh we, we make consecration and dedication right now for what you have for us we're amazed that we're so close to these events so we take this moment before we dismiss to renew our vows as, as we would to say we'll do your will I thank you for a rekindling of the will of God for all of our lives. Father, we're here on Sunday night, so we mean business. So I thank you for blessing them, strengthening them, encouraging them to fulfill their race. Hallelujah. Jesus, we look unto you. Oh, the perfecter of our faith, the author of our faith. We look unto you, the author of our salvation. 
Hallelujah, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Thank you for great grace upon Cornerstone, great grace upon everyone in this church. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, he, he just said something to me, and I want to see if I can say this the way he said it. Uh, don't be surprised or think it not strange that information he gives you uh, for you to do will, be, will bring you joyfulness. It'll surprise you. Things that he's going to have you do will bring forth great joy. Because he's like a dad. <laughs> he is a dad. <laughs> Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for new, new orders, a refreshing of our old orders, and a realization of the authority that you've given with these orders. Thank you for making every person in this room a mouthpiece for you. Use them, Lord. We thank you for it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Now, in the old days, we would do this like maybe 70 through maybe 77, 78. We don't have to do it tonight, but we would come down and get on our knees, and the guy preaching would come by and just hit us on the head. He'd go, bam, do the will of God. Bam, do the will of God. I'm like, wow, is that necessary? But you know what? I, I'm doing the will of God. <laughs> so I don't think we have to do that tonight, but let the Lord deal with your heart. Whatever He's given you to do, It'll be the coolest thing you ever did. You won't miss out on anything. You'll be blessed. He'll add to your life. Everything about him is not, things aren't taken away, they're added. Now hang with me. I just feel it. You know, I have so much in my heart. I don't want the Lord to come back because i got so much to fulfill. You're not done at the rapture. The rapture is a beginning, not an ending. Because you can kind of feel that. Well, what about this? What about this? What about this? You're not done. We're going to come back and do stuff for a thousand years. We're tasting of the powers of the world to come. So don't, don't, let, don't, let, don't think about that and go, you know what? The rapture, if you like to play the guitar, wait till you see this guy play the guitar in his glorified body. You won't all of a sudden turn into a weirdo, I hate the guitar. No, you'll be a better guitar player. Things are enhanced, not diminished. Let me say that again. Things are enhanced, not diminished. We'll get into that Wednesday night. So you have a wonderful future. Don't be sad about, you know, what about this, what about that? No, no, no. We're coming back and going to reign for a thousand years. Let's thank Him, then we'll go. Lord, we love You. We magnify You. We magnify You. We glorify You. Thank You for dying for us, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth and goodwill toward man. Lifted up, the Savior is, in all of our hearts and our eyes and our minds. We bless You, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. Father, thank you for giving your Son. Thank you for redeeming us. We bless you and magnify you and honor you, Lord. Honor you, Lord. Hallelujah. Someone's getting your knee repaired. I don't know the whole details, but uh, some kind of damage in your knee. I know that may be common, but I, I'm reluctant to call it out, but I'm, I'm going to do it. You're damaged. This other one's really po popular or whatever. Whiplash. Whoever had whiplash, watch, check it out. The Lord's healing at 7.30. 7.30 on Sunday night. Whiplash. Lord, restore their neck and their muscles and their shoulders. Thank you for taking care of them. Hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Somebody's got trouble with the blood flow to your legs. Your legs are healed right now in Jesus' name. Blood flow to your legs be restored right now in Jesus' name. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for that. You know, and I know this one is common, and I, but I can tell you story after story after story after story. Someone's got irritable bowel syndrome. Your digestive tract's messed up. You don't have it anymore. You're healed. Praise God. Praise God. Someone's pancreas is coming alive. Your, your pancreas was like dormant or dead. Your pancreas is coming alive right now. In Jesus' name. Thank you for that, Lord. That's so sweet of you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The interior, somebody's ear is being healed. Like the interior part where things come together, you know, all that stuff. Uh, the Lord's restoring it right now. In Jesus' name. Thank you for restoring their ears, Lord. Appreciate that, Lord. That's so kind of you. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for that. Mm, thank you for that, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. God's so cool. You know, I was in Sydney, Australia. Uh, I'd been in Brisbane preaching in the Raymond School, and I went over to Sydney to preach. And this worship leader 
told his wife, whatever you do, bring our daughter to church today. She's about 15, didn't want to come. He said, whatever you do, you drag her to church. So I was preaching on end times, and you, she was sitting about right there, and she could tell she didn't like it. You know, she communicated to me while I'm preaching that she wasn't excited about it. She's like sitting there going, well, you know, I, you know I'm, pre- I'm going to preach the message anyway. You know, I'm used to that. I, that's how my whole first 25 years of ministry was. I'm in 35 years now. Maybe 33 of it were all like that, you know. And uh, so it was common. And so I preached, and at the end of the message, I had a word of Someone had damage in their tailbone. I said, you're healed. And I uh, didn't call anybody down because I was calling other people down. That 15-year-old came up to me afterwards with her mom and dad. She said, I didn't want to come to church. I got mad at my mom and dad. She said, I'm eighth in pole vaulting in Australia, and I fell and busted my tailbone. She said, God healed my tailbone right there. He, she's mad, doesn't want to be there, doesn't like the message, and the Lord reaches out to her and loves on her. His mercy endures forever. He's just good. I could tell you a story. I could tell you I could tell you. Let me give you one more from Pittsburgh years ago. I had a word of knowledge that someone had, uh, uh, what do you call it when they have to go in for surgery on their backside? What's that called? Uh, oh, what's the word? No. Uh, <laughs> hemorrhoids. And I said, I said, <laughs> so, so the Lord said, I'm in, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mark Motors Church. It's called Berean Fellowship. This is 30 years ago. Lord said, hemorrhoids. I said, I'm not calling that out. He said, you're a chicken. I said, okay, there's somebody here. You got hemorrhoids. This lady was in the church getting ready to go in for surgery on her hemorrhoids. And the Lord told her, Joe's going to call that out. And you can either come down and get healed or you can go have your surgery. She came down and got healed. She was mad because she'd been drinking this chalk all week before she went and had her surgery. <laughs> I've preached in other churches in that city and that lady's gone to me. Uh, I won't tell you her name. She's about 80 years old now, and every time she goes, she goes, Joe, don't tell that story about my hemorrhoids. I said, I won't. That's how much he loves you. Something that we think, you know, no big deal. He just loves you. Well, Pastor Chris Romine in Kentucky, his mom was hearing a message I did on tape 30 years ago, and I called out someone had damage in their knees. She got her knees healed listening to a tape that's 30-something years old. You don't even have to be in the room. Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We magnify your goodness and magnify your mercy. We give you glory. We give you honor and give you praise. We lift up your name, Jesus. Lift up your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming tonight. You're telling the Lord you love Him, so thanks for taking the time. I know you're super busy, but you're here on Sunday night. We'll come back Wednesday morning for healing school. Come back Wednesday night. We'll either get into the millennium or we'll see what Pastor uh, uh, Chris may have something he wants me to do. So we'll find out what the Lord has us do. But I won't sing anything off my greatest hits album, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll keep you from having, being tormented, okay? How's that, all right? Amen. Here, give Pastor Chris a big hand as he comes. Thank you for coming tonight. God bless you, Pastor Chris. Have a great night. Now, before we go tonight, I want everybody to listen to me because I have a story to tell that, that Joe hasn't heard either. Keep on playing, brother. It's fine. One year ago, Joe was here. One year ago. I want to tell you a story, a true story. Because every life in here counts. I look around. I see young and old. And, and even though tonight is very much like a year ago, we have many people that come to church, you just assume everybody's saved, living for the Lord. We can assume. Everybody say assume. Assumption is the wrong thing. Okay? And so we never know where people are at, but one year ago, Joe was here. Comes but the same week every, every, every year. That's just way we have it set up. That Sunday morning he came, there was a, a gentleman that had moved back to our, uh, our uh, area. Uh, he was on the, living on the West Coast, he came back, grown man, was having some issues and some challenges in his life like many people do. And when he moved back to be with his family here, his mom and dad, he began to attend the church here just like his parents did. And um, this is a pretty, pretty amazing. He came, he had been coming for about uh, four, five, six months when Joe came. And that morning, um, he came with his parents. He's grown. He came with them. And uh, 
His mom said this, it was pretty amazing that when he left service that morning, here's what he said. He said, we coming back tonight? And she says, well, well we can. He says, I, I like that. I, I like to come back to tonight. You know, that Sunday night was very similar to tonight. Joe taught, taught the Word of God. Amen. At the end of the service, he turned it over to me. Okay. That, that night he turned over, he, he called some words of knowledge and different things. But I, I had impressed in my heart that to give an altar call. That night when Joe turned it back over me, giving that altar call, that man came back to the Lord. As a kid, he grew up, he received Jesus, he walked with the Lord, he had gotten away from God, he'd done his own thing like the prodigal son. But that night, he wanted to come back. That night, he was ripe, he was ready. He committed his life, recommitted his life to the Lord and began his new walk with Christ. He truly did, he did. Little did we all know that just a few months later, he would suddenly die. Today he's in heaven, Joe. Today he's in heaven because he had recommitted his life to Christ. My question to you is, just because we go to church doesn't mean we have everything right. And faith has to be in Christ. My, my heart is for each and every person that you have the assurance that if you die tonight, heaven will be your home. See, our faith has to be in Him, not ourselves. Our faith has to be in what He did. And see, the point is that the, the, the message of the end times drew Him. And, and, it, it, and it got Him to a place where He realized that Jesus could be coming back any time. I should be ready. What about you? I said all that to say this. What about you? I'm not wishing anything happened to you or anything this. But if you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He wants you to know because He loves you. He died for you. He, he demonstrated His own love towards us even while we're yet de, uh, sinners. Christ died for us. Also tonight, if we have gotten away like that man did, away from the Lord, He allows us to come back. I like to say it like this, God allows U-turns. Amen. You know, in the old school when you had before that, you know, before there was all the cars and you had the the uh, navigation system and now your phone. Okay, now you people just use their phone. Before when you had the old time the old school garments and tom toms and up when you got off the, the path you were supposed to, to be on, it says recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. God allows U-turns, and He's always working to get you recalculated back on the path. So if you're not walking, if, you're, if, if you don't know Him or you're not walking with Him tonight, I want to invite you to come to Him.